Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. This is Navigating Cyber Insurance, Protecting Small Business in a Connected World. Um, we have a lot of important information to share with you today. We've got two great speakers. One of them you're probably, many of you are familiar with, the other you may not be. In fact, um, Tony and Michael, why, why don't I let you guys introduce yourselves here, if you don't mind coming off mute and, and activating your, your um, video. Tony, would you mind going first? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Kelly. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tony Lesurge. I'm CEO of EXP Technical. Been working in IT for 25 years over that at this point. And on at least 18 of those, I've been doing IT consulting for small and medium-sized organizations. Hey, uh, you know, I'm Michael Seacrest. Um, you know, welcome everyone, Kelly and Tony. Thank you both for, you know, having me and, and really educate some people on, you know, cyber insurance and cybersecurity. And, you know, hopefully at least one person will learn something. And, you know, I've been with uh, TechRug for about two and a half years now. So really trying to learn everything and anything that I can and educate, you know, our clients and even our clients' clients um, on, you know, the, the navigating cyber insurance. And I come from an insurance background. So, you know, right out of college, it was I started on more of the personal lines, more the, the uh, you know, homes, autos, bakeries, that type of thing. And then we have another side of the house that is tech rug that we started to dive into cybersecurity and cyber insurance. And that's when I really fell in love with it and how niche it is. And it changes constantly. And there's things to watch out for year after year. And, you know, these bad actors change constantly. So, you know, what it's it's what gets me out of bed every day and, and coming to work and, and educating people and anyone that wants to listen to me talk cyber insurance, I'm there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. So I'm going to share, oftentimes in these events, we avoid PowerPoint, but today we have a lot of detail to go over and some terminology. And so we have a PowerPoint presentation that, that will guide us through some of the, the discussion that we have today. And let's see here. Almost there. Thanks for your patience. So when I just so you know what to expect today, when I'm done with my announcements, which will be brief, I'll hand things back to Michael and he has some prepared information for you about cyber insurance coverage, about things that are new in 2024, industries that are impacted, the extent of that impact. Um, and from there, Tony will jump in and speak uh, to high rewards projects, um, projects that may either enhance cybersecurity in your organization, uh, or potentially uh, put you in the position where you qualify for cyber insurance or you get reduced premiums or extended coverage. So, And then after that is when um, perhaps it gets even more interesting. We'll have a roundtable discussion. I'll, I'm sure I'll have some questions by the time we get to that point for both of our panelists. But we want to hear from you, too. So you're welcome to present your questions. And the way that you can propose questions the easiest ways are through the chat or the Q&A features in Zoom. And the difference, in case you're curious, if you post something in chat, everybody in the webinar can see it. And that's okay. There's about 50 of us here, so it's it's not a huge group. But just know that there may be privacy concerns. Whereas if you use the Q&A button, uh, my understanding, I think it's just that the moderator, myself, and our two presenters can see um, your question. So if you're concerned about privacy or confidentiality, use the Q&A, but otherwise you can use the chat too. And I will try to moderate those questions when we get to that portion of our discussion. One question that always comes up is, is this presentation being recorded? And it is. Uh, it, I'll send an uh, email to you, hopefully before the end of next week, with a link to the recording. Usually what I like to do is um, edit the transcript and annotate that with links. And it takes me a few days to get through that. So be on the lookout for that. You are welcome to share that with others in your organization or others in your social circle that you think might benefit from this material. And I have just one more announcement to make, but it's a really important one that I wanna share with you. And that is, um, I, I wanna tease our next event. And usually we don't host these webinars in such close succession. Our next one comes on the heels of this event. It will be on June 20th. So it's less than a month from today, but it's a Thursday afternoon, much like this one. Um, we have a really special guest speaker for that event. That is Barrett Adam Simmons. She is the deputy director for CISA Region 10. And for those of you that don't know, um, CISA, you can see the emblem there, but CISA is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. They are part of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, CISA was established in 2018, but they are America's 
Cyber Defense Agency. And so she will have a lot of important information on things that you can do to protect your organization. Now, many of you have attended our events in the past, and we try to do something like this every year. Um, in the past, we've had FBI agents speak to our audience, and the FBI is more focused on law enforcement. So they speak about capturing bad guys and what happens after the event. Uh, I've spoken briefly with Barrett, and her information will be more about resources that are available to you now to protect your organization, to level up your cybersecurity posture. And, and I can't stress this enough, it's difficult to get speakers of this caliber to this series and they want as large of an audience as possible you know often and it's it's rare that that um that they're available for these sort of events usually when they're giving a, a presentation it's a keynote uh, speech at an industry event where people have traveled thousands of miles to attend and paid a lot of money to be part of some professional organization to be there so my i guess my my point here is that well, um i'll be sharing an invitation Please, I encourage you to attend, but also share that invitation with others that you think might be interested in attending as well. And again, that happens on June 20th at noon, so it's less than a month away. And then we're about to dive into our presentation here. I have a poll question, and let me, if I can find it here <laughs> in my Zoom features. Oh, I may have to... I'm going to stop sharing for a second to launch the poll. Bear with me. And the poll question is, there's no right answer or wrong answer to this question, but just imagine that you were hit with a ransomware attack on a Sunday afternoon on a weekend when, you know, it's, it's your, your, maybe you're not open for normal business hours, but who do you call first in that event? Yeah, and, and that's the, you know, million dollar question, Kelly, and I'll give everyone kind of a second to, you know, answer that question, you give them a minute here, but that's what everybody exactly. wants to know is when the doomsday happens, who do I call, who do I get in touch with, and a lot of people think that it's the managed service provider, the MSP, their IT people, when the reality is that it's your insurance company is who the first person you need to call and contact because they're going to, on your declarations page of your cyber insurance policy, say, hey, here's who you contact. It's gonna be a 24 by seven email person or a group of people that say, you know, this is who you contact. This is what we've got to do. Okay, we're gonna get our own people involved. And sure, that may be, you know, you get hit. It, uh, let me see, I see the answers here. It looks like 83% of you had said the MSP uh, which in reality, again, it, it's the insurance carrier. It's the insurance agent. That's who, that's who you've got to contact Very well, to figure yeah. out what the IT person can and can't do. Um, and, and I think that leads us kind of, Kelly, if you want to pull the, the yep. slides back up, um, that leads us into, you know, the cyber insurance, right? And that, um, you know, we want to make sure that obviously as the managed service provider, you're doing what you can do. But then again, what do we have to do if like I see a poll question in here or a, uh, a question and answer? I saw one that I pulled up while we were doing that um, where somebody is asking about a cyber policy. They have no clue if it's good. What am I looking for? You know, what are you looking for? Right. A lot of your local agents, you know, it's going to be your best friend, your brother, your sister, your cousin, whoever it is, they don't really understand the whole cyberspace being as niche as it is and unregulated as it is. No policies are going to look the same. So getting with someone that specializes in the cyber insurance industry and getting with someone that this is all we do, we talk about cyber insurance all the time. So your cyber policies, this is these are the key things here in this slide that you're going to want to look for. Obviously, the network security, um, I've seen policies include cyber extortion. Some don't, where somebody gets into your network work and now they're holding your data, it's encrypted. They want some sort of ransom payment, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's you know, $100,000, $200,000, $400,000, whatever that number looks like, these are things that we want to look for within the policy that are on the screen here, right? So, you know, then you run into issues where, um, you know, you have clients that are HIPAA compliant, right? You're going to have people that you work with. I was just talking to a lady yesterday that, you know, she's a, uh, a medical society that has a bunch of physicians under their society, right? That, you know, now we're going to run into HIPAA compliance issues if there is a breach that now there's HIPAA fines and things like that, that we've got to watch out for in the, the regulatory, um, you know, multimedia liability, liable, slander, those type of things. Um, another one to look for, um, 
The, you know, um, shutdown is another one. The business interruption is a, a huge component where, you know, if you're a manufacturer and you're shut down and you manufacture things like, um, you know, a, a bathrooms, if we're, we had a client where um, it was a, uh, they partnered with basically an apartment complex or apartment complexes that was a manufacturer and they manufactured the bathroom appliances, countertops, the, you know, the shower, toilets, things like that, where they got shut down and they were down for three weeks and they couldn't get back up and running. And they, he ended up losing 22% of his business because we were, he, one, he didn't have his insurance policy. Two, he didn't have MFA turned on. So it was very easy for someone to get into the network. And then the, the third component is he had to then figure it out all on his own. He had to hire his own, you know, PR team at that point to notify, you know, all of his clients. And there were, you know, if it's going to go out in the news, it's going to be on the news, God forbid. Um, you know, then we have to hire PR people. And there's a lot of costs that go into these things um, when you're looking at a cyber insurance policy. And, you know, a lot of clients will ask, you know, Michael, why do I need to carry cyber insurance? And my first response is go unplug your network, you know, at eight o'clock this morning and call me at five and let me know how things are going. Right. So that you know, cyber insurance is becoming more and more and more important. And, you know, you guys as clients have to understand that there's a cyber universe out there and that we need to protect you and your own, that not every single thing that you do or, or, or don't do right is not on the MSP entirely all of the time. So, you know, the cyber insurance, these are the components I would look for. But of course, with that, it's going to come requirements. It's going to be minimum requirements that we're looking for in terms of the cyber insurance provider. What do you need to have in place to get the insurance? Um, and Kelly, if you want to go on to the next yeah, slide. Yeah, I, I do. But can, can I interrupt for just a second? Yeah, because yeah, yeah. You, touched, you touched on something briefly there because you said something like the PR and reputational harm. Yep. I, and I'm not sure if I see that on your list, but is, are those costs typically, or are they often covered as part of a cyber insurance policy? Will it deal with uh, restoring your, your damaged reputation or some sort of um, way of uh, compensating you for that loss? I would say that in general, Kelly, that, um, you know, most of your policies should cover it. But like I said, all of these policies being unregulated, you know, it's not like your, you know, your car insurance is going to include certain things. The, you know, workers comp is going to include certain things because those are regul regulated spaces, regulated bodies where, hey, these minimum things have to be in here. Something like PR should be included, but is it included in all policies? It, unfortunately, it's not. And they, they're things that you've got to, you know, watch out for and as a consumer or as someone that's looking to purchase cyber insurance, hey, am I getting what I'm paying for? If it's 500 bucks a year or less that you're paying for cyber insurance, it's probably not going to cover a whole lot. But, um, you know, this space, and I see a question in here, I see a couple of questions in there too, just while we're on the topic, um, you know, why is it unregulated? Because there's so far, there hasn't been a government entity or a government body that's come in and said, hey, these are the minimum things that you have to have an ins as an insurance provider of a cyber policy that we haven't seen that in terms of hey it's got to include you know some sort of cyber extortion it's got to include BC or uh, PCI and regulatory fines it's got to include network security it's got to include multimedia liability we haven't seen that yet could that change in the next two years three years five years of course I think that's where we're headed because of the number of claims that we see in the industry as a whole not just at tech rug but in, in the insurance industry as a whole. Um, so to answer your question, Kelly, and answer the questions kind of in chat, um, you know, there, there is no one size fits all for this yet. Could that change? I hope that it does. And when that does happen, you're going to see carriers like we've already seen start to get out of this space and not write cyber insurance policies because they don't understand it. They don't want to do it. Their loss ratios take a huge hit when they write a bunch of $500 policies and then they have one full limit $10 million claim and they're, you know, now they're in an 80% loss ratio. They get killed. So they just get out of the space entirely. Um, and then, you know, going into, you know, this next slide that you have up now is what's going to be required to get cyber insurance. 
And that's the, you know, MFA is a huge one. We need to have MFA turned on just about anywhere that we can, you know, whether that's email, uh, remote access into the network, you know, the access to the backups, you know, pretty much everywhere that we can get it, we want to make sure it's there. You know, the EDR, um, endpoint detection response, um, things like that, the SOC SIM, those are other solutions um, that I would have on the network um, uh, being a, a client and it's going to make you more secure. You know, we need some sort of data encryption, the backups, you know, are we looking at some 321 segregated backup where, um, you know, it's off site and, it, you know, if we have to restore from backup, we can do it to get somebody out of the network. And then I think the last component, and I, I saw a little bit of it in the video too, that was presented before this was the cybersecurity awareness training. And I've done a couple of these now with FBI agents and they say the number one thing is to know what a phishing email looks like, know what, you know, when someone calls you and says that they're, you know, from one of the vendors that you may use, how are you validating that that person is um, who they say they are on the other end? Because maybe it's not. Maybe they'll say, hey, I'm from First you know, Bank of America. Um, I need you to verify your account information and send me money. You'd be surprised at the number of clients that are like, oh, yeah, OK, well, our account and routing number are this. And then they start having money pulled out of their account. It does. It does happen. And it happens constantly. And you know, we want to make sure that obviously the cyber insurance can stay affordable affordable and available to everyone. So we have to do these minimum things to get the cyber insurance policies. Um, and again, that's going to be MFA, that's some sort of EDR, backup, data encryption, um, and then a cybersecurity awareness training tool. Um, you know, with that getting into, so what's changed even from 2023 to 2024 and beyond, you know, what are we going to see, see to continue to change and, and going along with the uh, unregulatedness of this space is that we start to see co-insurance on ransomware and cyber, cyber extortion. So it takes after more of the health insurance approach where, you know, you go in to the doctor and you pay your, you know, $25 um, deductible just to show up and just to be there. And then all of a sudden the doctor says, hey, we need to do, you know, an MRI, we need to do a CAT scan, whatever. And then there, it's a $2,000 thing that you're responsible for 20%. The, uh, you know, your insurance will pick up the other 80%. So now this just became, you know, a $225 visit rather than just your, your, your deductible, right? So that's what they're starting to do on ransomware and cyber extortion, where they'll say, hey, the ransomware is $200,000, you're going to be responsible for whatever the co-insurance is. So now all of a sudden you're paying your $25,000 deductible plus the 20% on the cyber extortion and ransomware. So it's just, it, 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 it creates a headache of, oh, well, I didn't know this. We haven't budgeted for this. Okay, well, now the claim's going to get either, you know, we're not going to move forward until it gets paid. You have to pay your co-insurance and it can just get really, really bad. Or you'll see sublimates where you're paying for a million dollar policy or $500,000 policy, $2 million policy, whatever it is that on page 198 of your 200 page policy, it says, oh yeah, there's a sublimit for ransomware that's $50,000. And the bad actor that's in your network wants seven Bitcoin at $70,000 a Bitcoin. Well, we're limited to $50,000 or 150 or whatever that number looks like. So that's something else to be careful of that we've seen in this space. And I see it all the time. I see hundreds of these policies where you know, something is not the same as the other. Um, occasionally, you'll see a policy that's very comprehensive, but it costs 15, 20, $25,000, and it just becomes unaffordable for a lot of clients. And you know, in, in, in our programs and things that we kind of try to address these problems, we wanna make sure that, okay, if you're meeting this certain criteria that was on those insurance requirements on the slide before, what can we do to keep the cost down to 5,000 rather than 10,000? Or instead of 5,000, it's 2,500 bucks. What can we do for that? And then um, the last two components here is the definition of a computer system. You know, is coverage for data that's held in the cloud with your third party providers, right? Is that covered? You know, and, and a lot of policies, they say, you know what? No, it's, it's not going to be a covered cause of loss. Um, we're not going to pick this up. It's not within the definition of the policy. Sorry, there's no coverage for it. Um, or, you know, cyber terrorism, you know, the cyber terrorism and war and terrorism, you know, 
kind of like things that go on in, um, you know, Russia, Ukraine, you know, if China chose to attack, right, we got bigger problems. But, you know, cyber terrorism, if, if somebody attacks, um, you know, the U.S. is is the cyber um, component of that where they shut down, you know, they say they specifically target our managed service providers and impacts clients or they specifically target, you know, law firms, doctors, offices, manufacturers, whatever to cripple the U.S. Is that going to be covered within the policy? Some include it, some don't. So, you know, it's another thing to think about and just kind of get the, the, the brain working in that sense where, hey, what does my policy actually cover? What am I paying for? So, you know, when we go back to the, the local agents, you know, a lot of them are an inch deep, but a mile wide. So they know a lot of stuff, but a little bit about it. Um, and working with a cyber specific provider, right? You're going to, you know, we're going to be more of a, you know, inch wide, but a mile deep. So, you know, we want to make sure that, okay, here's what's changed in the space. What can we do for EXP's clients or what can we do for any of our clients that are looking for cyber insurance? How can we best protect them should something go wrong? And I'll never tell anyone ever that they're hundred percent covered for anything and everything that can go wrong. But if we can get as close as possible to 99% by constantly adapting and changing our policies, that's what we're going to try to do until this becomes regulated. And then, you know, then we obviously will have to see what, how the policies change then. But until that point, this is what we have to do. These are the things we have to be aware of. And then, you know, as we continue to look at what industries now are going to be the most targeted. And that's the next slide, Kelly. So, um, you know, a lot of people think that it's going to be financial and healthcare. When in reality, you know, these numbers that you're seeing here come from the net diligence report that's released every single year with updated numbers on claims and things like that. And this is taking out, you know, the MGMs of the world. This is taking out the, you know, $2 billion claims that happen um, in the cyberspace. Uh, this is more, you know, your professional services. So your accounts, your insurance agents, you know, those type of people that get hit the most. And this was just for the first half so far of, or for, I guess the first quarter of 2024, we've seen $304 million just on the professional services side. Um, and the, you know, the number of claims themselves was right around 1200 for the professional services. So, you know, it's, it's not a, you know, one industry is going to be targeted more than the other. Clearly you can see that, you know, there are a lot of claims and the claims are larger in certain spaces. But, you know, a lot of this is buckshot for these, these bad actors that try to get into the networks and they don't really care how they get in or who they get into. They're going to get in some way or another. You know, a lot of the time I relate it to, you know, fishing with a cast net, right? You're going to throw in and whatever you get, if you get bluegill, you get bass, you get catfish, it doesn't matter. Occasionally you're going to get that 10 pound, 15 pound fish in there, i.e. a larger company that may be 15, 20, 30, 40 million dollars in revenue, but you're also going to get the one person ops that are $150,000 in revenue. And these actors don't care. And a lot of the time they'll sit on your network for a day, two days a week, figure out what size company they're dealing with. And then say, Hey, you know what? We want 10 Bitcoin. We want $50 million. Good luck. So, you know, it, it's those things that it, it, it can be very scary in, in this instance. And I will get a lot of the time. OK, so what limit do I need to carry? And I never want to overinsure, insure, under insure any of my clients. So, of course, um, you know, my wallet would be very happy selling everyone a 10 million, 20 million dollar policy. But that's not the goal here. The goal is to best protect not only my MSPs and their clients, but anyone that's looking for cyber insurance, whether it's standalone outside of our program, it doesn't matter. But the, you know, the average cost for these things seems to continue, right? So if you look at this slide here, again, this is coming from the net diligence report that, hey, here's the average cost for the incidents. Here's a business interruption. That's about $370,000. The recovery for the, the incident itself, you're looking at about 210,000. And then the overall incident is about 709, right? So that's everything else outside of the recovery and business interruption. So when you factor those together, we're already over a million dollars. So, you know, I think a two million, unfortunately, a two million dollar policy is where I would start most people. And if you have a policy that's less than that, you know, I would reconsider, reevaluate, hey, what is our risk? What is our exposure? What does our security look like? Right. Let's take security focus first approach 
to the cyber insurance, and that will best protect every single person that's you know out there looking for the cyber insurance and understands the the necessity of carrying the policy to best protect themselves against their own negligence. And God forbid someone gets in the network. Thank you so much, Michael. Yeah, that's uh, 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 there's. A, a lot to consider there, and I think some of it will come back to. I, I was making notes as you were speaking, so uh, I, I have a, a long list of questions, and we have a few that are in our Q&A as well, um, so be prepared for that. Yeah, but, I, I welcome it. <laughs> all right. And so uh, just to keep on, on schedule here, our, that's time to segue to Tony LaSurge, EXP Technical CEO, and Tony has some information about high rewards projects. And let me advance our, your slide, Tony. So when you're ready, Tony, feel free to, to speak up. All right, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Kelly, and thank you, Michael. So yeah, high rewards projects, what, what do we mean by that? We've used that term. Basically what we're talking about <clears throat> in this context, obviously cybersecurity projects, uh, projects that can deliver value in, in multiple different ways. Um, we also use the term right-sized. So we work almost exclusively with small and mid-sized organizations. And you don't have armies of IT folks. You don't have multi-million dollar IT budgets. So we scope and deliver projects appropriately for smaller organizations. Now, the bang for the buck, the high reward uh, uh, comes, as I said, by delivering a project that's going to give you value in more than one way. Number one, if it's a cybersecurity project like we're talking about, it's going to put you in a better you know, position from a security posture perspective. Your organization is going to be better protected. But as Kelly mentioned earlier, the other benefits are you could either, you know, you're going to be meet the requirements for a cyber insurance policy, or even better, you're going to reduce the premiums for that policy by checking off, you know, more of the boxes. And we will go into some of the top things that you can do um, that the insurance provider uh, requires. And another one that people don't often think about, but we're seeing more and more is working your way through these types of projects will meet requirements from regula re regulators or vendors, right? So you might be subject to CMMC or HIPAA or ITAR. You know, that's an obvious one. You got to check the boxes, right? There's a lot, you know, 110, 130 controls you have to implement. You're going through the process of checking those boxes. But even if you're not subject to those, we're seeing more and more Large organizations, you know, in this part of the world where we live, Microsoft, Boeing, Amazon, are requiring their vendors to meet similar types of requirements as these regulations. So Microsoft has their SSPA. It's the Supplier Security and Privacy Assurance Program. We work with a number of clients who have to comply with that in order to do business. And often it's a large part of their business with Microsoft. So. That's what we mean by high rewards projects. What are some of the things, what are the key security controls or projects that you, you can do uh, to check those boxes, meet those requirements? So I've got a list of six here. This could have been 20, 30, 40 items on here, you know, more than that. Um, but you'll notice if you were paying attention that uh, these match up pretty closely with that list that Michael had on his slide. Um, there was a question that came through, what do some of these acronyms mean? So I'm going to go pretty quickly, but I'm going to cover that hopefully and answer that question. So we've got six items here. They're not necessarily in priority order, I would say, apart from number one. The biggest uh, attacks we see, the most, the highest volume of attacks we see are on identities. And what we mean by that is your logins, right? You'll log into your email with Microsoft or Google. You'll log into Zoom, your accounting system, your 15 other online services that you subscribe to. Those are your identities, your login, your password that we're, people are, are looking to compromise. And Michael mentioned it, the biggest way you can protect those is number one, MFA, that's multi-factor authentication, often referred to as 2FA, two-factor authentication as well. And 
most of you probably know this, but essentially what that is, is logging in with two things, something you know, your password, and either something you have, that might be your mobile phone that can receive a text message or have an authenticator app on it, or it could be something you are, your fingerprint, <clears throat> your face, your retina. So logging in with and verifying you are, who you are in more than one way. Now, the other thing that Michael said is MFA everywhere, right? And that can be difficult. I need MFA on every single system, backups, uh, backup system, remote access system, my 15 applications that I log into online. So one way we try to make that easier is through single sign-on, another acronym, SSO. So we set up multi-factor on your Microsoft account, right? That's usually the, the primary system. Then we tell Zoom, or your accounting system or your other applications, you're gonna log in using Microsoft authentication. So now you have MFA for that system, you have one less password that you need to remember and you're more secure. All right, I'm gonna keep going in the interest of time. Um, as I said, the rest of these I'll, I'll, I'll go through fairly quickly. They're not necessarily in priority order. Um, but EDR, that was, the, that was a question. What does it stand for? So EDR is endpoint detection and response. And it's basically the new antivirus. 10 years ago, everyone had to have antivirus. These days, everyone should have EDR. Uh, what's the differentiator? I'll get a little bit technical here. Antivirus was what we called signature-based. Basically, you download a file, click on a file, the antivirus uh, software says, I recognize that is a bad file. Well, endpoint detection and response is behavior-based. So rather than recognizing a bad file, it's recognizing bad behavior by a file or an application or a website. For example, this executable, this process on my system is changing every single file on my system, maybe encrypting it, I'm going to stop that. That looks like that's behaving badly. So that's what EDR is. It uses AI. It uses the cloud. Most of these systems as their engines, as their intelligence engines to do that. What we're seeing now, and this is relatively recent, is the extension of these EDR systems. And Michael also mentioned this. Um, you might see the term MDR, managed detection and response, or XDR, which is extended detection and response. And essentially what it is, is these systems are hooked up to other systems that can monitor and respond to the alerts or the incidents that they're generating. So SIEM, S-I-E-M, is Security Information and Event Management. That's a system that will uh, ingest and aggregate logs from your EDR and maybe from your firewall and maybe from Microsoft 365 and Google Workspace or any other security system. It will ingest and aggregate those logs and then it's smart. Maybe use, you know, a lot of them are using AI and machine learning and it's gonna bubble up alerts. Hey, this looks bad. This computer is has this issue going on. Oh, and also this identity on Microsoft for the same user looks like it's been compromised, I'm gonna generate an alert. And the final leg, the final piece of that puzzle is the SOC, Security Operations Center. Um, that's essentially people, a service you subscribe to, sitting and watching for those alerts to pop up. And when they see them, depending on the level of service you subscribe to, they're either gonna take action on your behalf, you know, push a button that kills that process, turns off that computer, rolls back that event, or they're going to call you, or they're going to call your IT department, or they're going to call your you know, EXP or your, your managed service IT service provider. So this type of service, this you know, EDR, SIM, SOC, is starting, we're seeing, to become affordable even to our small and mid-sized organizations. Does it cost more than your traditional, you know, low-cost antivirus? Yes, but it, it is not out of the reach these days of organizations that we work with. All right, um, I'll rattle through the rest of these quickly. So email protection, um, still the number one attack vector, as we call it, 
the way that they get to you is email, whether it be phishing, a bad link, a, you know, a bad file, whatever it might be. It's most commonly getting to people via an email. And so you need a filtering system on your email. Um, there's lots of different types out there. Um, there's lots of different options, but you need something that's looking at your inbound email, filtering it, you know, looking at links, looking at attachments. Most people have that these days. The next one's a big one, device management and encryption. We actually see this as probably the next big thing we can do and, and is actually coming becoming technically viable to protect people. So think of this scenario, you, your identity, we talked about that, right? Your login is compromised. It happens. Even we've seen people working around, you know, you have MFA, they're even figuring out ways to get around that. So your identity is compromised. Someone somewhere else in the world or in the country has that information and is able to log in as you but they're logging in from a different location on a different device. So if we can configure your systems to only accept a login or get, provide access to your data from a known device that has a certificate or a certain security profile or is pre-registered with your system, then we can you know, mitigate, it's all about layers of defense, right? So your identity is being compromised, but the device doesn't match, isn't compliant, isn't on the approved list. That's what we're talking about when we talk about device management. Encryption as well, I think was something that Michael mentioned and that, you know, that's more common, easier to do these days. The device, your cell phone, your laptop, your computer should be encrypted. So if it falls into the wrong hands, it's lost, stolen. Or, or a compromise, then the data is not accessible to the to the attacker. Uh, Michael mentioned backups, and he mentioned some some acronyms or some some things that we talk about in the industry. Basically, you need backups. You need more than one copy of your backup. You need an offsite or cloud backup, but also you should have a backup that is what we say offline or air gapped, so that if you get compromised, if your systems network get compromised, the attacker can't go delete the backups or encrypt the backups so that they're no longer available to you. So, you know, hopefully the prior controls that you've put in place and projects you've done are not leading to an incident. But if there is an incident, we need to be able to recover and we need a copy of the data that cannot be tampered with that we can now restore. Um, and finally, people, right? Michael mentioned it. Uh, people are the weak link. We, we are all the weak link. And uh, security awareness training is one way to mitigate that. So, you know, you can have all the controls in the world, spend millions of dollars on technology. But if one person is uh, induced, you know, unwittingly to run a file, click a link, whatever, you know, give up their username and password, whatever it might be, hand, you know, wire money somewhere, you know, we've seen and heard about that, then that's, you know, all the security controls in the world are not going to, uh, are not going to help. So um, you can sub subscribe to a security awareness training platform Usually they also come with some kind of testing or what we call simulated phishing so that you can see who's clicking the links. Then you can go talk to them. Then you can provide additional training to those people. Um, you know, those, those are subscriptions and platforms and another cost. As Kelly uh, mentioned before the webinar, EXP Technical has developed security awareness training that we um, make freely available to uh, to you know, well, anyone, but, you know, we're focused on the Pacific Northwest and people in our community. Um, and we wanted to make that available to them at no cost. So that's one way you can do it at EXP Academy, academy.exptechnical.com. I'll give it a plug. Um, but uh, yeah, we, there's systems, there's, you know, subscriptions you can use beyond that, that will, will take it to the next step with simulated phishing training, you know, and, and a lot more. 
So like I said, that's six out of many, many things you can do. Um, at this point, I think we're ready for questions. Yes, and, and I want to jump in first, if you don't mind, because uh, I, I want to get you to speaking to get to each other or maybe arm wrestling a little bit but i i don't think it'll be arm wrestling but but you know michael mentioned um coverage and things that are covered tony mentioned high rewards projects and it and this also relates to a question in the qa q a or a comment in the q a someone says i'm working hard to get sso across our apps so suppose let me give you a scenario Suppose Tony is working with one of our clients and they've already got MFA, but they're thinking about implementing single sign-on yep. and there's a cost associated with that. And Tony might have an inkling that, well, there's a, a cost benefit to this too. I guess my question is to you, Michael, is there a way to determine if there will be a savings on their, you know, greater coverage or savings yeah. on their premiums or how do we, how do we yeah, it's, explain it's to a, them what the cost benefit is of that project? Right. It's a, it's a great question. And, you know, that's what a lot of people, it's like, Hey, is this worth, you know, if the insurance policy is going to cost X, is it worth Y to implement this service that you're talking about, whether it's SSO, MFA, any, you know, some sort of backup, some, you know, SOC SIM, security awareness training, whatever it is. And a lot of the time, what I will do is I will get two quotes and I'll say, hey, here's one based on your current security. Here's one based on what, you know, Kelly and Tony and the rest of the EXP team are talking about. We'll look at the differences. This this one over here without implementing MFA, without the single sign on, um, your current security stack, whatever it looks like, it's $10,000 a year. Here's one in the, you know, our, our tech road program, another insurance policy, uh, um, where you do have this stuff implemented, it's $5,000 a year. I think for $5,000, we can go back to Kelly and Tony and the team and say, hey, let's go ahead and implement this. I had one, um, you know, a real world example uh, is I had a, um, they were a home designer and remodeler. They, they were paying about $25,000, $26,000 for their cyber insurance with their current security, they heard about one of uh, uh, one of our webinars and heard about us and kind of they tuned in kind of like everyone is here and they said hey you know let's let's go ahead and look at my current policy look at my current security and i said hey you're paying 25,000 now if you implement mfa and you do some sort of segregated backup the policy came in at about i want to say it was 134 135 so we were able to save them you know $10,000 on their insurance premium just by implementing MFA MFA and the MSP said it was about $3 an inbox. So it was definitely worth that company to, you know, go and look at this. And now obviously everyone's savings are going to differ because, you know, at different organizations, different spaces, but definitely I will get the two quotes and say, hey, here's one based on your current. Here's one based on implementing what Kelly and Tony are talking about and what we want you to implement from the insurance side. Let's talk about it. Right. And there's a, there's a good comment in the Q&A about that, too. It's not just the implementation cost, but there might be licensing costs for upgrading right. to an enterprise version of a product. Right. And so so that's where EXP can help on one side of this is the cost. These are the tools that need to be in place. These are the costs associated with that. And it sounds like, Michael, you're saying you can pre prepare like a two pro, pro, pro forma uh, proposals. If you go this yeah. route, it's this. If you go that route, it's that. Well, I, I'm going to. So. Sorry, Tony, we didn't give you a chance to chime in on that. I think I spoke over you, but let's Carry go on. back to that scenario, though, the 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 scary scenario that we started in the poll question uh, and talk about incident response, because I think it's important for people to really consider that now on a day like today when the sun's shining and birds are chirping. Mm -hmm. you, you know, what happens if an event happens on the weekend? And, and maybe you two can both speak to how does the incident response plan roll out in those scenarios? Yeah, I mean, I Michael rightly said call your call your insurer, call the 24/7 number. I mean, <clears throat> there's a small number of things we can do, right? Even if we're not on the Tech Rug certified program, I, or your IT department or people like us, but it's really limited to uh shut, you know, we can shut down the systems, right? We we cannot begin the incident response which i'm sure michael can can talk to in a second which might be you know we're not going to begin to restore systems we're not going to start going through the seven step procedure to mitigate resolve restore uh, in an event until we get the blessing of the carrier 
Um, but uh, I would say it's worth that call on the weekend to your 24 seven IT number, whoever that might be, just to at least do, you know, prevention, right? Shut down the incident, stop it getting worse before you move into, and then I'll, I'll let Michael step into the incident response procedure. Yeah, it, it, you know, it goes back to the poll question, you know, like you alluded to that, you know, you got to contact the insurance carrier first before your MSP and let them tell you what to do. And, you know, God forbid it is a Sunday at two o'clock and, you know, we're going into Memorial Day weekend here where a lot of people have off on Monday. Most people are going to take off on Friday. So this is Maybe when we, we shouldn't have said this. I'm hit. sorry, <laughs> knock on wood, right? <laughs> yeah, right. And knock on wood. This is when this is when people get hit is it's the long weekends. Oh. You're rushing out of the office. Um, you know, something happens, but, you know, God forbid, but, you know, you know, Tony, as you alluded to that, as you guys go through the certification as the MSP, now any of the clients that you guys have that have a tech rug cyber insurance policy, we no longer have to wait for the insurance carrier to tell us what to do and when to do it. So it shifts that poll question to that 83 or 85 percent where they said, hey, I want to talk to my MSP first. That's what we want. You know, I, I, I can't stand when people present a problem and don't have a solution for it where they'll say, hey, here's the issue. We have a cyber problem. We don't want the MSPs to touch the network. The insurance carrier wants to get their, get their own people involved. You know, the clients that are in the in this chat and prospective clients in this chat and in this in this uh, webinar, right, are they want you guys to get involved immediately and you guys can't, right? You guys can, sure, you can shut down the machine, you can change your password, that's great. That's about all you can do and that's all the insurance carriers want you to do. So, you know, here at TechRug and how we address, again, the problem, we created a solution where now our MSPs are going to get certified, i.e., you know, EXP, they're certified, they're going to get certified, where now any of their clients no longer have to sit around and contact the insurance company, hope they get a hold of somebody on a Sunday, somebody responds, and now we're unclear, and, you know, it's, we're kind of muddy in the water as far as, you know, when is somebody going to get back to us? Are we going to hear? It says 24 by 7. How true is that? Versus now let's go through TechRug where I can contact Tony, Kelly, whoever at EXP, and they can help me at 205 rather than wait till, you know, Monday or Tuesday morning when somebody gets back in the office for the cyber insurance carrier. So it kind of shifts the approach to it. And Kelly and Tony will tell you that they've been trained not to touch the dead body until they're authorized to do so. Otherwise, they can open themselves up to subrogation issues where they get sued by insurance companies or they can void the claims for their clients. And that's the last thing we want to happen is to where now we're starting to butt heads, policies are button heads, and that's what we don't want. So, you know, if we can do you know, address that problem of the incident response itself, let's create a true incident response plan with every single one of EXP's clients, but also do it at a discounted cyber insurance rate because you work with EXP, that's what we're trying to do. So if I'm hearing right, let, let me summarize too and, 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 and speak to the big picture too. The big picture for everyone is you want your IT department, whether it's an outsourced IT support provider or whether it's people on staff um, or whether it's EXP or someone else, you want that organization to be working very closely with your insurance provider and, and going through these incident response plans and tabletop exercises now. That's that's one component. Yep. And then another, what you're saying is that we're currently engaged in a process. I might use the wrong term, so forgive me if I say something that's not technically accurate, but some sort of pre-certification where EXP technical is authorized to do more than just the basic remediation. I mean, it still may be somewhat basic remediation, but we can go a little bit further than, than we may otherwise be able to as a result of the fact that we work with TechRug. TechRug has validated that we're, we're not going to do something crazy or something um, uh, in, inefficient or ineffective in, the, in those initial hours of that right. event. And, okay. you know, Kelly and Tony will tell you that, you know, our process, we take them through every single year. They want to punch me in the face when they fill out our 200 point assessment <laughs> to make sure that they are, you know, they're a best in breed MSP. And here at TechRug, that's all we work with. And so we know what standard you guys are holding your clients to. And we know that we're looking at certain things. We're following certain frameworks. Um, and, and we want to make sure that the clients are best protected. So, yeah, you want to make sure, um, you know, even if you're not working with EXP, 
MSP, whoever you're working with, talk to your insurance company, figure out, okay, what can my service provider do for me? And what can they not do for me? Nine times out of 10, almost 10 out of 10 times, you know, your insurance company is going to want to bring in their own people. They're going to want to use their own groups. So again, here's another problem. Let's address the problem and get our MSPs, i.e. EXP certified. So what, what people might not realize too, is that there, there are, there may be cross purposes there too. And in this came, this became obvious of all places to me on Netflix last night. <laughs> um, I, I hesitate to admit, but I'm going to, my wife and I started watching the documentary about the Ashley Madison breach. Uh -huh. And in the after hours of the, in the early stages of that, there were IT staff that wanted to, when they found a, a problematic issue, they wanted to wipe and reload and restore those computers. The forensics team, which is different than insurance, but the forensic team was like, no, don't touch that. That's our only evidence to try to find out who's behind this. I, I say that only to mention that, you know, you might be thinking as an end user as, or as a business leader who's in, attending this event, you might think, well, everybody wants to get us back on our feet. And we do, but the path might be a little bit different and we want to be sure that we're doing things in the right order that don't upset the insurance carrier who ultimately is going to recompensate the the injured party as well. Um, it, it, and I, I see some heads nodding from Michael and Tony. And I, I'm assuming you agree with that too, or that we're, that we're heading down the right path there. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, so I I want to go into another kind of uncomfortable area, and and uh, one of our comments spoke to this a little bit, and I'm I'm going to summarize. But there are some instances, and and uh, where and I hear reports of this, not from necessarily with TechRug, but um, where claims get denied for reasons. Um, and maybe Michael, you could speak to reasons why a claim yeah. might get denied. You mentioned before sublimits and I, I hope everyone paid attention to that a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar sublimit on ransomware sounds like a lot but an average claim is in the millions right and right. so but I, i'm getting off track or too far into the details can you speak to a little bit about reasons why a claim might get denied after the fact aside from that there wasn't an agreed upon remediation plan Right. So the number one is going to be misrepresentation on an insurance application, right? So if you're not consulting with your managed service provider, your technical team, whoever it is, when you fill out a cyber insurance application and you check boxes like, yes, we have MFA. Yes, we have some sort of endpoint detection response or EDR that Tony had talked about. And then all of a sudden, when you go to file a claim, they say, hold on, wait a minute. When we were doing our forensic research, we found that MFA was never turned on. It was never implemented. Uh, now we get into an issue where then they deny the claim and they say, you know, hey, you told us one thing, but you're doing another. Why are we going to pay out on this claim? You know, claim denied. Um, so it's it's beneficial for everyone. And sure, it may take longer to get, you know, the uh, IT company to say, hey, can you help me answer this? Let's kind of work together and go through this insurance application and make sure that we're answering those as truthfully as we can. And if we have to implement additional things and we do that, but misrepresentation, Kelly, I would say is the number one uh, probably reason for denying a claim that you're telling us one thing, but you're doing another. And it might not, it, it's not intentional. It might not be fraudulent. I mean, somebody, right. it, it might be based on ignorance or just not quite understanding what the, what the survey or the questionnaire is truly asking. Correct. You got it. Tony, can you speak to that too, about our assistance? Like they're there, I'm assuming for most of our clients, they get these surveys, they hand them over to their consultant from EXP technical, right? Yeah. We often, our consultants often get uh, asked to help or just to plain fill out the, the cyber insurance survey. So we do see it all the time. And uh, we, we are very clear with our team, you answer it honestly. And, you know, then often we may go back to whoever, you know, the, the insurer is or the broker is and, and say, hey, if we do X, Y, Z, we've been, as we've been talking about, how much will that help? Um, and obviously now we're we're partnered up with TechRug. That would that would be a, our first port of call. But yes, it happens often. We try to be honest. We make recommendations. I mean, honestly, we use it as a a good you know segue to hey, we should be doing some of these things. Um, so, <laughs> uh, in and trying to act in the best interest of our clients. And ultimately, though, it's our client that's responsible, right? I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to pass the buck, but if if 
our client is communicating to the insurance carrier that certain things were done. It's not EXP that is certifying. We're we're helping in good mm. faith and answering to the best of our ability, right. correct? Yeah, yeah. And in the same way that when we talk about um, maybe an information security officer in an organization, right? We often, our advice is, is clear. The information security officer is not the IT person, or it shouldn't necessarily be the IT person. Um, at least the decision maker, right? It should be the person who's fiscally responsible for the organization, right? And can make that call. So yeah, yes, the, the IT and folks, right? Whoever they may be are responsible for the security controls and for filling out the data, but ultimately the the ownership or the, the, you know, the executives or the people financially responsible for the organization are the ones who are, are responsible. Got it. And there, there's a quick question, maybe Tony, you can address that came in in the Q&A that's a little bit of a, just a cybersecurity best practices question, which is, do you have any advice on whether to accept cookies while browsing on the web? <laughs> um, it, it depends. I mean, sometimes you have to, right, in order for the thing to work like you want it, the site to function. But my general default, unless I'm in a real hurry, is like minimal only, right? There's usually... You know, do you want to accept all the cookies or do you want to accept only the ones that will allow this website to function? Um, that's the one I would, that's the option I would recommend you pick because the other ones typically are around ads and marketing and tracking. So if you can choose to decline all of those, but allow the functional ones to work, that's, that's what I would do. Often though, we're in a hurry. Right. We just want to get to the website. We just like go away through that pop up that's asking me about cookies. I don't I just make it go away. Click accept all. So it takes a little discipline to uh, say, OK, no, I want to review my options. I only want the functional ones. That's probably more gotcha. of an answer than you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, and, and I want to start wrapping up and summarizing before I turn it back to each of you two gentlemen for for a last word. But uh, if I'm summarizing what I'm hearing. And especially in the last few comments, it's like this is really a three-way partnership, or ideally it should be from what I'm hearing. You know, there are, Tony mentioned like the NIST controls. This is a, a list of 110 cybersecurity controls that protect sensitive data. But there's the IT support provider or an IT department that is one member of this partnership that's implementing these controls and and uh, implementing layers of security to protect sensitive data and the people and your business. There is an insurance carrier or insurance agent and insurance provider that is um, protecting, you know, restoring, providing some remedy if the worst happens. And then the other one too that I want to stress that's kind of silent in this webinar, but are asking questions are all the people in attendance that it, it is a three-way partnership that business leaders need to assess the level of risk that they're comfortable with, what's justified and what isn't in terms of what they want to spend on. And it's really important to have these conversations now as we keep alluding to rather than after the fact. Um, one of the reasons why we host these events is because we really believe in sharing knowledge and sharing success. We want to bring people together so that we can plan for these things. Sometimes I'm going to say a, a, a bad phrase that I try to avoid, but some people say it's not a matter of if, but when. I prefer not to say that, but just say if we all come together in a partnership, you know, if we work together um, we can delay that so that it's not today, hopefully not tomorrow and not tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and the next day. But if it is, we've also got insurance and other things in place that minimize the impact. And that takes us to, we're, we're almost to the end here. I will leave it. Um, why don't we ask, I'll ask for last words from each of you. Tony, why don't you go first and we'll let Mike, Michael have the, the final word here. I, you know, you pretty much summed it up, Kelly. It's really about building uh, a partnership between our, you know, your IT, your carrier, your executive decision making team. Um, but also, again, I would encourage people to look at that list of controls requirements and be proactive and, and, you know, start <clears throat> make a plan, start chipping them off one by one so that, you know, uh, when you you, when your policy renewal comes up in 2025 and there's seven extra things that they now require, right? They're, you're ahead of the game. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, Kelly and Tony, thanks again for, you know, setting this up and including us and everyone that's listening here, you know, thanks for listening to us, listen to us talk about, you know, cyber insurance and uh, cybersecurity for the last, you know, hour. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But uh, it really is a a, a three pronged approach, right, to, hey, let's get a, you know, a security focused first company, right? We want to get you guys to make sure that we have the necessary, um, you know, securities in place. Let's get a cyber insurance policy to go along with it as, you know, that last line of defense that all the securities didn't work or whatever. Because again, it's buckshot. It's whoever can get in, however they can get in, they're going to, and it's constant changing. Um, so, and, and that last component is really working and creating a true incident response plan that, okay, we have the insurance policy. Now, what can we do? And, you know, working with EXP Tech and TechRug, um, you know, we can get this resolved faster and a, a lot easier and smoother for everyone um, and get everybody back up and running and everyone happy and paid and whoever needs what um, taken care of a lot quicker. So um, I will leave it there. I see our information okay. here. If anyone, um, um, you know, really wants to send policies, has more questions afterwards, you know, shoot me an email um, and, and I'm happy to connect with any of you. Please. Yeah. yeah there, Thank I've you, listed Michael. our emails. Thanks everyone for attending. If you want to connect, my email's here. Michael's is as well. You can speak to us independently or bring us all together and we'd be happy to talk with you. Thanks again, everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you.